Thank you, May. Um, and also, thank you to the staff. I was out here sitting before everyone came, and um, I saw them wiping down the seats and doing all the things to prepare this occasion. Um, and so let's give a round of applause to them as well. I hope of making a difference, you see. But I'll never do that laying down here, hiding down here out the way of the world. For within me is a courage to be, a courage to belong, to stand, to lead, you see. For I dream of a better world. Good afternoon, Dean Noria, distinguished guests, faculty, alumni, my discussion group who made me say that, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and the class of 2019. <laughs> we are here, and at five or even 21 years old, I could have not dreamt of being here. Harvard Business School was unimaginable. There was no access point to this place. I spoke with my mother. I told her I was graduating from Harvard Business School. And the first thing she said was, are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, yes, ma'am. And the second thing that she said more seriously was, could you imagine my mother, my father, if they were alive today, seeing you graduate from Harvard Business School. My chest felt heavy, and my, fell, my shoulders fell back just a bit. And I knew that she felt the weight of that question just as much as I did. See, her mother was a cook at a local bar, and her father a carpenter. They raised 10 children in a three-bedroom home in one of the toughest neighborhoods in New Orleans. To stand here, for me, is a testament to courage of many individuals, family members, friends, teachers, my section, Section B. Those leaders who connected the dots indiscriminately between my potential and possibility. That's the difference, you see. Today, I want to um, explore three questions. The first question is, what is the relationship between courage and belonging? The second is, what becomes of belonging to each other if we sacrifice our courage to stand out? And the third is, can the courage to be get us closer to a more just world? So the first question, I want to take time today to share a story of one of the most impressive students that I've ever known. After graduating from Yale, <laughs> do not judge me, I became a ninth grade math teacher at my former high school. And one day, the noise in my classroom began to settle. Kendrick, my student, who sat in the last seat in the last row farthest from my desk, was quiet and seemingly alone. He courageously raised his hand to go to the board for the first time and maybe the last time that year. He stood up, gently walked to the board, and the class fell silent. And so did I. In detail, he explained to the class his correct reasoning. And I smiled, I nodded my head, and I looked at Kendrick and said, job well done. Kendrick sat down, smiled back, and I looked into this young man's eyes and honestly saw the innocence of the world, joy. I could see a pure potential, an authentic humanness, not bound by race, by class, by gender, 
nor by this need to impress or to conform to some standard, just kindred. I could also see what he sacrificed in walking up that day. What we all sacrifice really when we stand up for ourselves, his cool, his comfort, just to take that leap, to do something different. And that moment in that classroom was nothing short of a miracle for me. Because I remember years later from that day, speaking to Kendrick's mother in my mama's kitchen, sitting in those wooden chairs, holding back our tears as Kendrick's mom asked, how do I save my son from a stronghold of a community to which he belonged? And I didn't have an answer. How does one empower an agency of courage, a courage to break apart from something that just doesn't seem right, that just doesn't seem fair? Three months later, and less than two miles from my mama's house, which is where I was staying, at 20, Kendrick was murdered. And it hurt because through these glimpses of that courageous boy at that board, I could see what was possible for him. I look back on Kendrick's life, and I honestly see so much of myself in this man. I see all of us, really, navigating this courage to be individuals while defined by a, a whole, just or unjust. This courage to be and to belong, to spit in and to stand out, to have a deep obligation for some tradition and to find our own reason for life and meaning. I observed this courage to be an individual classmate during cold calls when your palms sweat just a bit and your voice quivers. I observed this courage to be in two classmates who passionately took opposing views and their eyes tear. When we show up as our most courageous selves, we illuminate parts of ourselves unbound by the constraints to which we belong. And it is here I want to ask the second question. What does it mean to belong to each other if we sacrifice our courage to stand out? During my HBS summer, I was in San Francisco for the first time. <laughs> it was great. For my internship. And unfortunately, I did not have enough money to find housing for more than just a month. I also found out I did not meet the grades here academically to move on to the second year of business school without a petition. I was embarrassed, ashamed. I felt like I worked so hard to get here to fail here. And a part of me had lost the courage to be me, to stand out, to share my unique voice. And that summer in San Francisco, I called my great auntie Louise. She's one of the eldest in my family who I had just met but once, according to her. She moved to San Francisco in the 1950s, 1960s. And when I called her, she answered the phone and she didn't hesitate to say, I have space for you right here, baby. You can come stay with me. I knocked at her door, she opened it, I embraced her, and I felt like we'd known each other for years, you know. I knew then that everything that summer was going to be okay. Because I learned from my great auntie that I come from a resilient people. And over turkey wings and steamed rice, my great auntie shared stories of growing up with my grandmother as a sharecropper in Louisiana. And she would say that they were poor, poor, but the foundation was good. And being intimately present with stories of the Jim Crow South, I realized just how two generations of a courageous people, of those sacrifices, got me here to this place from a plantation 
and to this podium from a petition, and I am thankful. Class of 2019, I hope that we never forget those things that we are thankful for, you know, and the what and whom we are fighting for, you see, and that we do not hold on to belonging to some corrupt cause or community of hate for the sake of excluding others or otherwise that we maintain our agency to speak up against the unjust whole, because fitting in holds us so close sometimes that it protects us from doing the righteous thing. It separates us across class and race and gender, otherness. It creates borders and walls out of misplaced fear. I hope that we remember to be courageous to give space for those voices that may not sit at the table. And we remember those moments here when we navigated difficult conversations on moral hazards, for example. Thank you, Professor Moss. <laughs> that we remember moments when we danced courageously. Well, some of us, because I've seen most of y'all dance and it's not too good. <laughs> um, <laughs> courageously singing songs that we'll try to remember. We have to hold on to us and that and our humanness. Because when we decide to stand as a class in the best versions of ourselves, I hope that we choose to tap into our courage, our courage to fight for a better world and for each other and for our children and for our classmates' children, and that we lean into what we learned here to speak truth even when your voice may quiver and your hands may tremble a bit. Finally, to the last question, can the courage to be our individual selves get us closer to a more just world? There is a theory that I hold close, that the act of courage itself is connected to something divine, that our act to do that courageous thing in the world, to speak up against racism and inequity, to separate ourselves from the hate and violence in spite of, is to move in accordance with something bigger than ourselves. To connect to courage is to connect to something, a moral right. I believe the courage to be is the one true way to get us moving toward hope and love and equality in this world again. I am here in front of you like Kendrick at the front of the whiteboard, bearing no standard, no construct, no need to impress. Harvard Business School, I am knocking at your, at your door to say, as we move on from this day, class of 2019, I want to see some courage to be in some people somewhere. Like Maya Angelou preached, I want to see some peace somewhere. I want to see some more leadership and justice, some equity and leadership, some diversity in these boardrooms, and real considerations for the humanness of us. Let's dance daringly with our divinity, that courage to stand for what is right, and create moments that form new shared experiences that move us all closer together. For well, I have hopes of making a difference, you see. And I would never do that laying down here, hiding down here, crawling down here, out the way of the world. For in me is a courage to be, a courage to belong, to stand, to lead, you see. Because I have dreams of a better world. For an amazing two years, Harvard Business School and the class of 2019, I say to you, job well done. Thank you.